Hello, my name is Sam Hume, and I am the writer and presenter of the History of Witchcraft podcast. Ryan has very kindly offered me the chance to address his audience, that is to say you, and talk about my show. The history of witchcraft is, unsurprisingly, about the history of witchcraft, but it is also much more than that. It's about spells, too. It's also about examining what makes communities tick, and then conversely what makes them tear themselves apart. It's about people that fill the gaps in their knowledge with beliefs that, to our modern ears, might seem silly, but often made complete sense to those that held them. To sound utterly pretentious, it is about the instinctual behaviours that are shared by societies separated by both time and geography. The fear of the unknown, the lust for power, mob mentalities that drive people to do terrible things. It's also quite entertaining, if I do say so myself, but then again I might be biased. With the benefit of several centuries distance, it's easy to find humour in amongst the more morbid tales. The Anglo-Saxon witch that tried to turn back the Norman invasion by mooning them. The Romans' phallic defence against the evil eye. The Genevan husband who, after complaining about Halloween festivities, was tied to a horse while his neighbours dressed as his wife and then beat him with sticks. There are many traditions, folktales and superstitions that fall under the umbrella of the history of witchcraft, and over the course of the podcast I'm sure we'll cover most of them. Thanks again to Ryan for offering me this opportunity, and I'll now leave you to enjoy his dulcet tones, keen mind, and incredible knowledge about the ancient world. Is that enough flattery, Ryan? It's too much. Yeah. In all seriousness, the History of Ancient Greece is one of the best podcasts out there, and Ryan is a genuine treat to listen to. He manages to craft a narrative that's both cohesive and entertaining out of the smallest fragments of sources, and gives us a nod and a wink whenever Herodotus gets slightly too imaginative. All that's left for me to do is to thank you, the listeners, for hearing me out. If, after this episode, you decide to give the History of Witchcraft a listen, you can find the show on all good podcatcher apps, as well as through the show's Facebook page. I hope you enjoy this next episode of the History of Ancient Greece. I know I will. Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 52, Early Euripides. The last Athenian playwright whose works have survived is Euripides. He was the youngest of the three great Athenian tragedians. According to legend, Euripides was born on the island of Salamis, on the very same day of the Battle of Salamis in 480 BC. If we can put any trust into the mocking allusions to his origins, found in the works of Aristophanes. His parents were poor and practiced occupations that the Athenians considered degrading. Specifically, his father and mother sold vegetables. This was probably just slander, though, because whatever the truth may have been, it did not stop Euripides from receiving an excellent education as a youth, and thus, because of this, he was more than likely from a privileged background. As a young man, it is reported that he had a sober and energetic character, as well as a love of learning. When his father received an oracle saying that his son was fated to win crowns of victory, he insisted that Euripides begin to train for a career in athletics, which he excelled at. And as a youth, he served for a short time as both a dancer and a torchbearer for the rites of Apollo. His education was not confined to athletics, though, as he also studied painting and philosophy under the masters Perdiccas and Amaxagoras. Presumably, after coming to the conclusion that his father had guessed the meaning of the oracle wrong, the young Euripides realized that he was destined for a career on the stage. He initially performed as an actor, but his voice was not strong enough, so he concentrated on his role as a playwright. Though he held a philosophical disposition, 
Euripides preferred the poetry of drama to prose as a means of developing and broadcasting his philosophical ideas and beliefs. These beliefs, as we will see, differed in many ways from what others perceived around him. Euripides first competed in the city Dionysia in 455 BC, just one year after the death of Aeschylus. But it was not until 442-441 BC that he won a first prize. Altogether, his plays won first prize only five times. Undoubtedly because the ideas expressed in his plays pushed the boundary of what was customary to his audiences. Tragic poets were often mocked by comic poets during the dramatic festivals, and Euripides was parodied more than most. Aristophanes scripted him as a character in at least three plays. He characterized Euripides as a spokesman for destructive new ideas associated with declining standards in both society and tragedy. Similarly, Aristotle wrote that the art form of tragedy grew under the influence of Aeschylus, matured in the hands of Sophocles, and then began its precipitous decline with Euripides. However, the plays of Euripides and those of Aeschylus and Sophocles indicate a difference in outlook between the three men, a generational gap probably influenced by the happenings of the middle decades of the 5th century BC. Aeschylus still looked back to the Archaic period, while Sophocles was in transition between the two periods, and Euripides was fully imbued with the new spirit of the classical age. While all three use the mythical past to comment on present issues, Euripides took it a step further as his characters were more controversial and more direct, sometimes even going as far as to challenge the democratic order. He also concentrated more on aspects of normal human behavior rather than the deeds of heroic figures of myth. In doing so, he also gave prominent roles to intelligent female characters. Both of these aspects are reflected in a comment attributed to him by Aristophanes in his Comedy of the Frogs, saying, quote, I made tragedy more democratic, end quote. Euripides also posited that an individual's mental state, rather than their social ranking or physical condition, was their true index of worth. Using psychological analysis, he attempted to bring man face to face with himself and his problems. Psychological reversals are common in his plays, and sometimes they happen so suddenly that inconsistencies in characterization was an issue for many later literary critics. Others, though, see it differently, believing that he conceived and expressed the tragic state of life as something that results from the conflict between individuals of different temperaments, or the tension between reason and passion. Most often, the tragic element of his plays derives from the suffering of the main character and their inability, no matter what they try, to improve their situation. In the words of Aristotle, quote, Euripides is the most intensely tragic of all the poets, end quote. Another difference with his contemporaries is that Euripides' plays often begin in a boorish and simple manner. Unlike Sophocles, for example, who established the setting and the background of his plays in the introductory dialogue, Euripides used a monologue in which a divinity or a human character directly and simply tells the audience all that it needs to know in order to understand the subsequent action of the play. However, Euripides was credited with being an intellectual equal with contemporary philosophers, and his characters are given great rhetorical skills sometimes even in sung speeches, which previously had been the exclusive role of the chorus. And his plots are both intricate and unpredictable. He treats familiar myths with unconventional twists and altered chronologies in order to liven up the tales and ensure that the audience was gripped by the story. His works often express the intellectual spirit of his time, that being the logical analysis of institutions and values and the reevaluation of traditional ideas such as religious and moral beliefs. For example, he used drama to express, among other things, his mistrust of religious traditions and the very essence of anthropocentric religion. In doing so, he removed the previously prominent roles of Greek gods and generally restricted their appearance to only the beginning or the end of his plays. In fact, he was often criticized for doing this by his contemporaries, as well as for his frequent use of convenient coincidence in the form of the deus ex machina at the end of many of his plays. When this occurs, his gods appear lifeless and mechanical, simply hanging on a crane. This has been condemned by some as unimaginative, while others see it as a commentary on his skepticism about the gods in general. For Euripides, the gods were as full of life as the ones hanging on his cranes. 
Aeschylus had written his own epitaph, commemorating his life as a warrior, fighting for Athens against Persia, without any mention of his success as a playwright. And Sophocles was celebrated by his contemporaries for his social skills and contributions to public life as a state official. But there are no records of Euripides' role in public life, except as a dramatist. We do know that Euripides had two disastrous marriages because both of his wives were supposedly unfaithful. As a result, the already antisocial Euripides was said to have become a brooding and bookish recluse who shunned all forms of laughter and made a home for himself in a cave on Salamis. Aristophanes mocks him here too, saying that he lived depressingly in an unkept home, surrounded by the tattered costumes of his disreputable characters. Regardless, in his cave home at Salamis, he supposedly built an impressive library that was considered one of the most comprehensive private libraries in Athens. This so-called Cave of Euripides has been tentatively identified, thanks to the discovery of a fragmentary black figure Skiphos, dating to the late 5th century BC, that has the name of Euripides inscribed upon it. However, the inscribed letters are written in a manner that would have been used in the Hellenistic or Roman period, which seems to signify that he might have had fans of some sort, bringing votive offerings to his old stomping ground. It is not specified whether his home was still standing or if it was just a shrine at that point. Most scholars, though, believe that the account that he composed his works in a cave on Salamis was a later tradition, and it probably symbolizes the isolation of an intellectual who was rather ahead of his time, and not real physical isolation. Regardless, the impression of Euripides that has been passed down by his contemporaries is of a haughty, solitary man, withdrawn from the world, scolding, melancholy, and unsociable. In the Frogs, composed after the deaths of both Aeschylus and Euripides, Aristophanes imagines the god Dionysus venturing down into Hades in search of the best poet to bring back to Athens. After a debate between the two deceased bards, the god brings Aeschylus back to life, because he is more useful to Athens on account of his wisdom, rejecting Euripides as merely clever. Such comic evidence suggests that although the Athenians admired Euripides, they also mistrusted his intellectualism, at least during the long war with Sparta. One of his earliest surviving plays, Medea, includes a speech that he seems to have written in defense of himself as an intellectual ahead of his time though he put it in the mouth of the play's heroine, saying, quote, If you introduce new, intelligent ideas to fools, you will be thought frivolous, not intelligent. On the other hand, if you do get a reputation for surpassing those who are supposed to be intellectually sophisticated, you will seem to be a thorn in the city's flesh. This is what has happened to me. End quote. So as you can see, Euripides was what we would call a misunderstood genius. And like most misunderstood geniuses, he wasn't fully appreciated during his time. However, 19 of his roughly 95 plays remain intact, along with fragments, some substantial, of nine others, meaning that more of his plays have survived to a modern audience than those of both Aeschylus and Sophocles combined, even though during his lifetime, he achieved significantly less success at the Dionysia than those two. This was partly due to mere chance, and partly because, regardless of what Aristotle might have believed, his popularity grew as theirs declined, and his plays continued to be applauded, while theirs came to seem archaic. He became much admired in the Hellenistic period, as a cornerstone of ancient literary education, along with Homer and two 4th century BC men, Demosthenes and Menander, both of whom we will discuss in future episodes. And thanks to the 1st century AD tragedian Seneca, who adapted many of Euripides' works for a Roman audience, it was Euripides, not Aeschylus or Sophocles, who was the muse that presided over the rebirth of tragedy in Renaissance Europe. Last episode, we discussed the partially preserved satyr play, The Trackers, by Sophocles. Well now, we are going to discuss the only known satyr play to survive fully intact from antiquity, that being Euripides' Cyclops. It has an unknown date of production. Just to recap, a satyr play was a story taken from myth and then adorned with a chorus of satyrs. It was the fourth play performed at the Dionysia. This one, in particular, mixes the myth of Dionysus' capture by the satyrs with the well-known episode of Polyphemus the cannibal cyclops found in Homer's Odyssey. 
Although it is a comical, burlesque-like story, the meter is iambic trimeter, which is the meter of tragedy rather than comedy. This play offers an eccentric view of a mix of worlds, contemporary Athenian, Homeric, and fantasy. The island of Sicily is the setting for the play, Mount Etna in particular. At the time that this play was performed, Sicily was considered home to a sophisticated Hellenistic culture, but it also contained non-Greek peoples. In this play, it is portrayed as a barbaric place that is hostile to both man's laws and religion. The play begins with an opening monologue by Silenus, who tells the tale of how he and his satyrs, who are his offspring and followers, have been victimized by Polyphemus. The satyrs thus are now enslaved to work for the Cyclops and shepherd his flock, and so they are prevented from conducting their usual life as playful and lusty fawn-like spirits of the woods, who play nonchalantly while being protected by Dionysus. Odysseus has lost his way on the voyage home from the Trojan War, and he arrives with his hungry sailors. They meet Silenus and offer to trade wine for food. Since he was a servant of the wine god Dionysus, Silenus cannot resist obtaining the wine, despite the fact that the food is not his to trade. The Cyclops soon arrives and realizes that someone has been in his food. So Silenus accuses Odysseus of stealing the food and swears on the gods and the satyrs' lives, who are standing next to him, that he is telling the truth. As a sort of comic digression, Odysseus then has a lively debate with the Cyclops, arguing against their brutality and in favor of morality, laws, justice, and hospitality. The Cyclops talks in support of personal advantage and pleasure. He considers the idea of social justice as a fraud created by the weak for protection against the stronger, and claims that the only thing worthy of worship is wealth. After this debate concludes, the Cyclops brings Odysseus and his crew inside of his cave, where he then begins to devour some of them. Odysseus, though, manages to sneak out and hatches a scheme to get revenge. He gets the Cyclops and Silenus to drink from a wineskin together. The Cyclops, who is unaccustomed to drinking wine, becomes good and drunk and starts shouting that he has seen the gods. He then begins to call Silenus as Ganymede, the beautiful Trojan prince that Zeus made his immortal cupbearer, and steals him away into his cave, with the implication that he is about to do something sexual to him. It wouldn't be the first time that two unlikely people hooked up when alcohol was involved. Anyways, with the Cyclops now distracted, Odysseus executes the next phase of his plan. The satyrs initially offer to help, but later become afraid and offer a variety of absurd excuses when the time for action actually comes. The annoyed Odysseus gets his crew to help instead, and together they burn out the Cyclops' eye with a giant metal rod after he has passed out, either from inebriation, physical exertion, or both. Since Odysseus had told the Cyclops earlier, when questioned, that his name was no man or nobody, the Greek Outis, when the Cyclops yells out, who was responsible for blinding him, he says that, no man has blinded me. The satyrs mockingly have some fun with him over it. As he was about to sail away, Odysseus makes the mistake, however, of blurting out his true name as a result of his big ego. Although he successfully makes his escape, the rest of the troubles Odysseus faces on his voyage home are related to this act, as he then faces the wrath of Poseidon, the father of Polyphemus. The rest of Odysseus' story, as we mentioned, can be found in Homer's Odyssey. The shorter play, Rhesus, has been conventionally attributed to Euripides, but its authorship has been disputed since antiquity. Even most modern scholars are skeptical. Regardless, it is generally believed to have been written before 440 BC. The play takes place during the Trojan War, on the night when Odysseus and Diomede sneak into the Trojan camp. This story is also relayed in Book 10 of Homer's Iliad, though in this version, the part with Dolon is pushed to the background, and much more is revealed about Rhesus and the reactions of the Trojans to his murder. The play begins in the middle of the night. Trojan guards on the lookout become suspicious of enemy activity when they see bright fires in the Greek camp. They promptly inform Hector, who almost issues a general call to arms, before Aeneas makes them see how ill-advised this would be. Aeneas argues that their best bet would be to send someone to spy on the Greek camp and see what the enemy is up to. Hector agrees, and so Dolon volunteers to spy on the Greeks in exchange for Achilles' horses when the war is won. 
Hector accepts the deal and sends him out. Dolon leaves wearing the skin of a wolf and plans on deceiving the Greeks by walking on all fours. Rhesus, the neighboring king of Thrace, arrives to assist the Trojans soon after Dolon sets out. Hector berates him for coming so many years late, but ultimately relents, deciding that it was better to be late than never at all. Rhesus says that he intended on coming in the beginning, but was sidetracked, defending his own land from an attack by the Scythians. Meanwhile, Odysseus and Diomedes, who had made the bright fires, had already left the Greek camp. On their way into the Trojan encampment, they run into Dolon, whose wolf disguise didn't deceive them. They capture and interrogate him, ultimately finding out the positions of the Trojan allies. When they are finished with him, they kill Dolon and strip him of his armor. They then continue on to complete their mission. When they reach the encampment with the intention of killing Hector, Athena guides them to Rhesus' sleeping quarters instead, because they were not destined to kill Hector. That was set aside for somebody else. Diomedes slays Rhesus and others while Odysseus takes his prized horses and chariot before making their escape back to the Greek camp. The next day, rumors spread from Rhesus' men that it was an inside job, and that Hector was responsible. Hector arrives and argues that due to the sly tactics implemented, the guilty party could be only the wily Odysseus. The mother of Rhesus, one of the nine muses, it's not entirely sure which, then arrives and lays blame on Odysseus, Diomedes, and Athena. She also announces the imminent resurrection of Rhesus, who will become immortal, but will be sent to live in an underground cave. This is where the play ends. For continuation of this story, start with Book 11 of Homer's Iliad. The earliest surviving play that we can firmly attribute to Euripides, though, is Alcestis. It was performed as the fourth part of a tetralogy of unrelated plays, for which he won second place at the city Dionysia in 438 BC. This arrangement was abnormal, as the fourth part was traditionally a satyr play, as we have mentioned. In fact, Although Achestus is labeled as a tragedy, it contains numerous elements of a satyr play, so it's a very unusual play indeed. Long before the start of the play, King Admetus of Pharae in Thessaly was one of the Argonauts and took part in the Caledonian boar hunt. He was famed for his hospitality and justice. When Apollo was exiled from Mount Olympus and sentenced to nine years of servitude for killing the python at Delphi, he chose Admetus as his home and became his herdsman. During his time there, he helped Admetus win the hand in marriage of Alcestis, the daughter of Peleus, the king of Iolcus. Alcestis had so many suitors that Peleus dictated an apparently impossible task to the suitors, stating that in order to win the hand of Alcestis, they must yoke a boar and a lion together to a chariot. Well, with the help of Apollo, Admetus harnessed the yoke with the animals drove the chariot to Peleus, and thus married Alcestis. The greatest gift Apollo gave to Admetus, though, was that he persuaded the fates to grant him the privilege of living past the allotted time of his death. The fates usually did not give out such a privilege, but they were persuaded to make an exception after Apollo got them drunk. The gift, however, came with a price, as Admetus had to find someone else to sacrifice their own life for his when Thanatos, or death, comes to claim him. Well, when the time of Admetus' death was on hand, he still had not found a willing substitute. His elder father, Ferris, was unwilling to step in as he thought that it was ludicrous that he should ask to give up the life that he enjoys so much as part of this strange deal. Finally, Admetus' devoted, young, and beautiful wife, Alcestis, agreed to be taken in his place because she wished not to leave her children fatherless or to be deprived of her husband. Euripides' play begins with Alcestis on her deathbed. Just after Thanatos takes her away to the underworld, Admetus realizes that he does not want to live without her. He says, quote, I think my wife's fate is happier than my own, even though it may not seem so. No pain will ever touch her now, and she has ended life's many troubles with glory. But I, who have escaped my fate and ought not to be alive, shall now live out my life in sorrow. End quote. Admetus' friend, Heracles, then arrives at the palace, unbeknownst to what has just happened. This is where the satyr elements of the play kick in. Not wanting Heracles to find out the tragedy that has befallen him, a huge banquet is thrown in his honor. 
Heracles, naturally, acts like a drunken buffoon. When a servant snaps at him, irate because he misses their queen, Heracles finally finds out. He is embarrassed by his actions in their time of grief, and decides to help his friend by descending into Hades for a second time. The first being when he took the guard dog Cerberus as part of his twelve labors. There, he wrestles Thanatos and forces him to give up Alcestis. He then brings her back to Admetus and thus restores her to life. In other accounts, Persephone, queen of the underworld, instead brought Alcestis back to the upper world. Regardless, this is where Euripides' plays ends. Heracles would continue on with his many adventures, and Admetus and Alcestis would happily live out their days. Their son, Umelus, would lead a contingent from Pharae to fight in the Trojan War. Whereas Alcestis may seem like the traditional heroine in the modern sense, meaning she sacrificed her own life to save that of a loved one, Euripides' most well-known heroine in the tragic sense was arguably Medea, the centerpiece and namesake of his most famous play, which was performed in 431 BC. Although the plots of Greek tragedy were derived from myths familiar to the audience, there is very good reason to believe that the ending of Medea came as a complete surprise to the enthralled onlookers. It might be for this reason, then, that he took third, and thus placed last that year, behind Sophocles, who took second, and Euphorion, who won first prize. Euphorion was the son of Aeschylus, who himself was an author of many tragedies, although none have survived, unless you attribute Prometheus bound to him, as some scholars are keen to do. Regardless, while Aeschylus has his Clytemnestra, and Sophocles has his Antigone, of the three best-known tragedians, Euripides depicts the most sensational heroine, and it's probably for this reason that this is arguably his most well-known play. Although the norm by this point, as introduced by Sophocles, was three actors on stage, all scenes in Medea involve only two actors, Medea and someone else. At first glance, it might seem like this was a regression of sorts, but the one-on-one dialogue with only two actors actually highlighted Medea's skill and determination in her manipulation of powerful male figures in order to achieve her own ends. The story of Medea, though, must first begin with Jason, who along with the Argonauts had traveled on the Argo to the far eastern coast of the Black Sea, to the kingdom of Colchis, in pursuit of the Golden Fleece. The myth of the Argonauts is relayed in great detail by the 3rd century BC author Apollonius of Rhodes in his Argonautica, so we will wait until then to cover their expedition in great detail. When Jason arrived at Colchis, he met Medea, the daughter of the king Aetes, and she fell head over heels in love with him. She was a sorceress who served the goddess Hecate and was also the granddaughter of the sun god Helios and a niece of Circe so she had certain skills that would benefit the Argonauts in their quest. She promised to help them, but only on the condition that if they succeeded, Jason would take her with him and marry her when he sailed away back to Greece. Jason agreed, and so she used her magic in the form of narcotic herbs to help the Argonauts bypass a now sleeping dragon that was guarding the Golden Fleece. Jason then took the fleece and sailed away with Medea, but King Aetes pursued after them with his warships. Here is where Medea begins to show her mean streak. She had taken her younger brother along with her, and so in order to create a distraction, she villainously cut up her own brother and threw the pieces one by one overboard, causing her father to delay so that he could gather his son's pieces, which thus allowed Jason and Medea to escape back to Greece. When Jason arrived back to his home kingdom of Iolcus in Thessaly with a golden fleece, he was supposed to take control of the throne from his aging father Aeson, but his uncle Peleus, who held it in his place, had no intention of giving it up, and so Medea decided to get revenge. She gathered the daughters of Peleus together and showed them the extent of her magical powers. When she threw an old ram into a boiling pot, mixed with herbs and special ingredients, After a few minutes of marinating, a young lamb jumped out and ran off to frolic in the meadows. Medea then told the onlooking amazed daughters how they could do the same thing to rejuvenate their father as well. So that night, the girls tied him up, drug him to the cauldron, and threw him into a pot full of boiling water. But Medea, sinisterly, had left out a few of the necessary ingredients on purpose, and the king was boiled alive. 
This naturally horrified the people of Iolcus, and to them, Medea fit the stereotype of the Eastern woman. Exotic, magical, uncivilized, and dangerous. So they drove Medea, as well as Jason, out of the city forever. Leaving Thessaly behind, Jason and Medea sailed southwards down the eastern coast of Greece until they came to Cape Sunion at the southern tip of Attica. Supposedly, Jason dedicated the Argo there by hanging it in the rafters of the Temple of Poseidon. Afterwards, the two eventually made their way to Corinth, where they were welcomed by their king Creon, not to be confused with the king of Thebes. He built them a nice house near the palace in the aristocratic district of the city. They lived there for 10 years and had children together. The sources differ on the total number, though. As time went on, Jason began to grow bored, as there was no great adventure any longer, or a position of authority in Corinthian society that he could obtain. Eventually, though, Creon suggested to Jason that he leave Medea and marry his own daughter, Glauchy, also called Creusa in some sources. Since Medea was a foreigner, his relationship with her came with no political benefits. But if he married Glauchy, he and his children with her would become heirs to the Corinthian throne. Jason was thrilled at this idea, but he somehow needed to get rid of Medea from the picture in order to fulfill his ambitions. Although he no doubt thought that this would be an easy task, it turned out to be personally devastating for Jason. And Euripides' portrayal of Medea is centered on a wife's calculated desire for revenge against her unfaithful husband. The play begins with Medea learning of Jason's plans to leave her in order to marry Glauchy. Medea had already borne Jason children, so his plans to leave her flouted the traditional social code governing marriage, as a husband had no moral right to divorce a wife who had fulfilled her primary duty by bearing legitimate children, especially sons. The nurse opens the play in front of Jason and Medea's house, explaining that Medea is not eating because she is grieving and is brooding with hate. She is distraught with anger and confusion at how Jason could leave her for another woman. And so the nurse is foreshadowing that something terrible is about to happen. Then, the attendant arrives with Medea's two sons, with the news that Creon is planning on banishing her and her two sons from Corinth. The nurse is astonished that Jason would allow this, but the attendant explains that the king is worried that Medea might become violent because she's desperate and full of hatred. Inside the house, you hear anguish and despair. At that time, the chorus walks up. They are essentially the neighbors who drive the action. They encourage her to come out of the house. Eventually, Medea takes their advice and does come out, at which point she gives her famous speech, griping and complaining about the lot of women. At one point, Medea says, quote, We women are the most unfortunate creatures. First, with an excess of wealth, it is required for us to buy a husband, and take for our bodies a master, for not to take one is even worse. And now the question is serious whether we take a good or a bad one, for there is no easy escape for a woman, nor can she say no to her marriage. End quote. This is just an excerpt, but the speech essentially discusses how women are dependent on men for their happiness. It's ironic because it's a 5th century BC play where a woman is griping about being subordinated since a husband actually had all the rights. In Athenian society, if a husband decided to leave his wife, she was destitute and couldn't do anything but return to the house of her father, or brother if her father wasn't alive, until she could find another husband. Essentially, Athenian women were always under the care of a man, with their relationship to a man being that of a servant to a kyrios, the Greek word for lord. She says that she's in the worst situation, though, because she's without a home, and she has no land of her own, since she has cut herself off from her father and killed her own brother, and so she truly has no one to turn to. There is a question of power here, similar to the battle of the sexes, on stage and in myth, where Medea must decide whether to suffer and die or to assert herself. Medea, however, is not at all the compliant and passive female that the average Greek male in the audience would have been used to. She was unwilling to be trampled upon by Jason's aspirations, and one consideration that drives the plot of the entire story is with what can Medea, suffering intensely the common plight of women, find some leverage to exercise her own power and take charge of the situation against Jason, who has all the obvious advantages. Medea does indeed find the strength that she possesses, 
She says, quote, A woman dreads the sight of cold steel and shrinks from contending with a sword face to face with a man. But wronged in love, no other soul can hold so many thoughts of blood. End quote. She turns to her own magical powers as a woman in order to fight back. While Medea was the niece of Circe, the magical goddess whom Odysseus would face, and she worshipped the goddess of black magic, Hecate, she didn't use that kind of magic. Instead, Medea turns to the same magical powers with which Pandora was once endowed and that all women possess. She has the ability to charm and seduce, to make men weak with her womanly wiles. Using these, she can face Jason with deceit and machinations rather than with head-on confrontation. At this time, Creon appears on stage with soldiers and asserts his power by telling Medea that she must leave before sunset. You'd expect her to get angry, but knowing that she cannot stand up to Creon in the same way that a man could, Medea remembers the powers given to Pandora and uses guile, charm, and persuasive speech in order to convince him that she needs to stay at least until sunrise so that she can gather her things together in order to survive in exile. Medea was really asking for more time, though, so she could have more time to think about how to destroy Jason. She thus manipulates Creon, although not in the same way that a man could manipulate another man. A man can stand face to face in battle, but a woman has to fight with cunning. At one point, she insists that women who bear children are due respect at least equal with that granted to men who fight as hoplites. She says, quote, People say that we women lead a safe life at home. While men have to go to war, what fools they are. I would much rather fight in the phalanx three times than give birth to a child only once. End quote. Furthermore, Medea realizes that childbirth is a woman's source of power, and that through her, children would be the only way that she could face Jason. Jason then returns home, all full of himself. He justifies his behavior self-righteously by blaming Medea's violent temper for her own banishment. He says that it's her own fault for showing such emotion when he left, and that if she would have just restrained herself... She would have been able to remain in Corinth and could have even remained as his mistress. But he self-righteously assures her that he has her best interests at heart and will provide means for her survival in exile. Jason plays the part of the typical male chauvinist pig by dismissing his long-held companion and mother of his children without thought or care for her well-being or anything but himself really. As a male in a male-dominated society, he has certain powers and advantages that he is all too willing to abuse for his own benefit. He proclaims to Medea, quote, It would have been better for men to have gotten their children in some other way, and women not to have existed. Then life would have been good. End quote. Jason only sees women as a nuisance, and a means to a self-serving end. Jason, though, does not have much self-awareness, and so his boasting and self-righteousness only infuriates Medea even further. When he finishes boasting, Medea curses at him and drives him out of their home. As the chorus sings of the difficulties of exile, Aegeus, the king of Athens, arrives with his attendants on a state visit to see his old friends in Corinth. He finds Medea in her sad and angry state. She tells him how Jason has wronged her and asks that in her exile, if she could come to Athens since she has no place to go. Aegeus is hesitant, though, because he didn't want to make the king of Corinth angry. So Medea starts thinking. She knew that Aegeus had gone to Delphi to find out why he wasn't able to produce any children, but he didn't get the answer that he was looking for, or more precisely, he didn't understand what the oracle was telling him. We discussed this in episode 24. Anyways, children are what men want the most, in order to carry on their name into the future. And she promised to give him magical herbs to end his fertility if he gives her a home. A desperate Aegeus agrees, and then leaves, fully unaware of what was about to happen, as Medea finally realizes what would crush Jason. She realizes that men need women to have children, their protection against old age, and their only hope of immortality. By procreation, men pass on their seed, and in a sense, can live on forever through them. Medea, therefore, taps into her own sources of womanly power to do battle with Jason, to harm him in the most brutal and profane way imaginable, cutting him off from immortality by ending his present bloodline and blocking any chance he has of starting over again. Her victory will be personally devastating, 
but nonetheless complete. Medea now has decided to use her children in order to get back at Jason. So she takes the golden crown and a robe and smears them both with poison, unbeknownst to anyone else. When Jason returns, she uses guile, begging him for forgiveness, and asks him to give these two items as gifts to his new bride. She further asks if their sons can take them so that Glauki would be taken by the two children and would want to keep them for herself instead of sending them into exile with their mother. She's playing on Jason's desperation for their children, and their innocence likely would cause Glauki to accept the gifts. He agrees, and so Jason, the attendant, the nurse, and the children head off for the palace. With this, Medea can't do anything but wait, and there's a long scene where she worries herself into a frenzy. Eventually, the attendant returns with the news that Medea must leave immediately, because something horrible has happened. He won't say what it is, but the nurse arrives and explains. Glauki liked the gifts very much, and so she put them on, but immediately the poison began eating away at her flesh. She began to catch on fire, but she could not get the robe off. So Creon tries to help, but his own skin begins to burn. The tradition at Corinth is that she ran and jumped into the fountain, one of its oldest monuments, known as the Fountain of Glauki, but she couldn't get the robe off and she drowned in the process, as well as her father who jumped into the fountain to try to save her. Naturally, Medea is very happy at this news, but she knows that Jason still hasn't lost everything yet. A wall painting from Pompeii does a very good job at foreshadowing what's about to happen next. Medea, who is shown concealing a knife, is torn between her love for her children, who are playing innocently with the attendant, and her hatred for Jason. Medea is so desperate for revenge that she has convinced herself that she must kill her own children, meaning Jason's immortality, in order to get back at him. He would thus have no more children, and the woman that he could have gotten more from is also now dead. So Medea goes back into the house to execute the final phase of her devious plan. At this point, a crushed Jason arrives back at their house, only to hear the sound of his children screaming. At this, the chorus is horrified, and the house is locked. Realizing what is happening, Jason bangs on the door ferociously until Medea eventually comes out. At the sight of her carrying the dead bodies of her two children, Jason collapses in grief. Then, he curses her and tries to kill her, but she is protected by her magic and her grandfather Helios, who sends down a chariot to whisk her away. When this play was put on, the scene was accomplished using the mechany the crane-like device usually reserved for the appearance of a god or goddess. Medea then rides off in the chariot to Athens, with the bodies of her two dead children, leaving behind a broken Jason. The chorus of Corinthian women lament the horrors of what just happened. Medea, though, will come to play a role in the Aegeus and Theseus saga at Athens, which we also recounted in episode 24. A vase painting from southern Italy dating to around 400 BC shows the infamous last scene, Medea is dressed up in eastern garb, in the chariot of Helios, pulled by large snakes, suggesting her magical and poisonous ways. Down below her are the lifeless bodies of her two children. The attendant is crying, and Jason is shocked at the whole scene. Before the 5th century BC, there seems to have been two variants of the Medea myth. According to one, Medea killed her children by accident, while the other blamed their murders on the angry citizens of Corinth. And so, Medea's deliberate murder of her children then appears to be Euripides' own invention. The play concludes with Jason back at Cape Sunion. He sits under the Argo in the Temple of Poseidon, grieving for the glory days, when a plank from the boat above falls off and hits him on the head, killing him in a humiliating manner. The questions that Sophocles posed about the society in which he lived seem tame compared with the more searching critiques of Greek values that appear in Euripides' plays. In Medea, Euripides used the tale of Jason, the celebrated leader of the Argonauts, in their quest for the Golden Fleece, to undermine conventional views of what makes a hero. He has such confidence in the excellence of the Greek way of life that even when he has decided to abandon Medea to marry a Corinthian princess, He boasts of the benefits he has given to her by rescuing her from a barbarian land and transplanting her to Greece. Predictably, these arguments do not sit well with a highly intelligent witch who has the advantage of a non-Greek perspective. 
The bitter laments of Medea enable the audience to see things differently as she details the constraints on her life as a woman in a Greek city. Jason's shameful rationalizations for his actions raise serious questions about a society that makes heroes of such men. Furthermore, Medea is widely seen as a proto-feminist text to the extent that it sympathetically explores the disadvantages of being a woman in a patriarchal society. In conflict with any sort of sympathetic undertone, though, is Medea's barbarian identity, which would antagonize a 5th century BC Greek audience. Greek tragedies, however, were not morality plays, and when in the play's horrifying conclusion, Medea decides to take vengeance on Jason by killing their children and thus subverting her proper role as a wife and mother, even those in the audience who were sympathetic to her plight probably shifted their sympathy to the bereaved father, in the same way that Sophocles' audience must have felt for the harsh Creon, when his actions led to the death not only of Antigone, but of his own wife and son as well. Medea was only one of the plays in which Euripides explored the dynamics of the conflict between reason, which could justify Jason in deserting his wife, who had risked her life for him in her youth for a more advantageous situation, and passion, which could move a mother to kill her own offspring. Inevitably, the agonizing conflict that Mark plays like Antigone struck a particularly resonant chord with the audience in Medea, which was produced just as a war was breaking out between two very different states, with opposing views of the world. The play is also the only Greek tragedy in which a kin killer makes it unpunished to the end of the play, and the only one about child killing in which the deed is performed in cold blood, as opposed to a state of temporary madness. Hippolytus was produced in 428 BC, and was part of a trilogy at the city Dionysia, for which Euripides took first prize. Iophone, the son of Sophocles, took second place. He wrote around 50 plays, of which only a few fragments have survived. Ion of Chios, one-third. He lived from around 490 to 420 BC, and was another prolific dramatist in the 5th century BC. Sadly, though, of his many plays and prose works, only a few fragments have survived. According to Plutarch, though, he enjoyed the patronage of Cimon and severely criticized Pericles in some of his works. He also wrote lyric poems, comedies, epigrams, paeons, hymns, and elegies, and after the death of Aeschylus was when he started to get into tragedy writing. Although he may have written upward of 40 tragedies, he only won first prize once. However, the year he did win, he also won the Dithrambic competition, both at the same city Dionysia, and so to celebrate, he presented every Athenian in attendance with a pitcher of key and wine. Strabo mentions him as a man of considerable wealth, and among the most celebrated men of Chios. Anyways, back to the play that beat Ion for first prize in 428 BC. Euripides' Hippolytus is set in the Peloponnesian city of Troezen, or Theseus, the king of Athens, is serving a year's exile after he murdered a local king and his sons. His illegitimate son is Hippolytus, whose birth was the result of Theseus's rape of the Amazon Hippolyta. He has been trained since childhood by the king of Troezen, Pythias. At the opening of the play, the goddess of love, Aphrodite, explains that Hippolytus has sworn chastity, and so he refuses to worship her. Instead, he honors the virgin goddess of the hunt, Artemis. This has led her to initiate a plan of vengeance on Hippolytus. She explains that when Hippolytus had gone home to Athens two years previously, Aphrodite inspired Theseus' wife and Hippolytus' stepmother, Phaedra, to fall in love with her stepson. Nothing came of it because Hippolytus went back to Troezen. But now that Theseus, Phaedra, and Hippolytus are once again in the same city, trouble begins to brew. Aphrodite's monologue ends, and action in the play begins as Hippolytus appears with his followers and shows reverence to a statue of Artemis by offering her a garland. A servant warns him about slighting Aphrodite, but Hippolytus refuses to listen. The chorus, consisting of the young married women of Troezen, enter and describe how Theseus' wife, Phaedra, has not eaten or slept in three days. A sickly-looking Phaedra appears with her nurse. After an agonizing discussion between the two women, Phaedra finally confesses to her that she is ill because she loves Hippolytus and she can never be with him, so she is starving herself in order to die with her honor intact. 
The nurse reassures Phaedra that she won't tell anyone, but the moment that she saw Hippolytus, she spilled the beans, but only after she had him swear an oath never to tell anyone. He agrees, and she informs him of Phaedra's sexual lust for him, and suggests that he consider yielding to her in order to improve her health. He predictively reacts with a furious tirade, and threatens to tell his father Theseus everything as soon as he arrives. He then storms off the stage. Phaedra arrives and realizes that disaster is imminent. After making the chorus swear secrecy, she goes inside where she hangs herself. When Theseus returns, he discovers his wife's dead body. Because the chorus is sworn to secrecy, though, they cannot tell Theseus why she killed herself. But Theseus discovers a letter on Phaedra's body, which falsely asserts that she was raped by Hippolytus. An enraged Theseus immediately summons his son. Hippolytus enters and protests his innocence, but he cannot tell him the actual truth because of the binding oath that he swore to the nurse. So Theseus, taking his wife's letter as proof of his son's guilt, exiles Hippolytus and calls upon Poseidon to place a curse on him. The chorus is saddened by this news, and so they sing a lament for Hippolytus. Then a messenger enters and describes a gruesome scene to Theseus. As Hippolytus got into his chariot in order to leave the kingdom, a bull roared out of the sea and frightened his horses. This caused him to be flung off his chariot amongst the rocks, but he got tangled in the reins, and so, as the chariot kept moving, Hippolytus was dragged behind, and he was in critical condition. After announcing this gruesome and sad story to Theseus, the messenger also protests Hippolytus' innocence, but Theseus refuses to believe him too. But then Artemis appears, a duke's ex machina, and rages at Theseus for causing such misfortune for his own son. She tells him the truth that there was no rape, and that Phaedra had lied and his son is innocent. Theseus is devastated by this revelation. Hippolytus is then carried onto the stage. He is physically battered and barely clinging to life. In the last moments of the play, Theseus begs his son for forgiveness. Hippolytus forgives him. Kind words are exchanged between father and son, and then Hippolytus dies. In this play, all characters, both the humans and the gods, have imperfections and can be jealous and brutal in their vengeance. They all have blind spots that keep them from seeing and understanding others with empathy, and these blind spots result in tragic outcomes. The play presents two goddesses who represent two aspects of the human spirit in conflict. One aspect is sexual desire, represented by Aphrodite and personified by Phaedra. The second aspect is Sophrosyne meaning chasteness or purity, which is represented by Artemis and personified by Hippolytus. At the point that Medea and Hippolytus were written, Athens had found itself embroiled in what would be an almost three decades long war with Sparta and its allies. Naturally, Euripides would be highly influenced by those events. In fact, when Euripides' plays are sequenced in time, they reveal not only the evolution of a playwright, but a sort of spiritual biography. With the Peloponnesian War looming in the background, he seems to have an early period of patriotism at the outset, the Heraclidae and the Suppliants, a middle period of disillusionment at the senselessness of war, Hecuba and the Trojan women, an escapist period with a focus on romantic intrigue, Ion, Iphigenia and Taurus, and Helen, and a final period of tragic despair, Orestes, the Phoenician women, and the Bacchae. With that being said, about 80% of his plays have been lost, and so we don't have the full picture to make a complete and accurate assessment of his works. Regardless, the plays towards the end of Euripides' life and their underlying themes and possible contemporary commentary will be the subject of the next episode. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 53, Euripides at War. (laughs) 